What is up, everybody? Happy Thursday. So good to see you. I'm broadcasting live from my studio here at home, but we're piped in to our special guest today all the way from the UK. Let me get into my deck. It looks something like this. So hello, donation futurists, you doers. You know, you're doers, not talkers. You donuts, you crazy people. I know who you are. So on today's show, on today's show, there's all this buzz that everybody's talking about, buzz, 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 about community. How do we build community? How do we harvest community? How, we, how do we monetize and leverage community? Well, that's the topic that we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about how to build and engage online community. And who are we going to be talking to? Well, none other than my friend Tom Ross. He's of Design Cuts. Design Cuts. You guys know them because it's longtime collaborate, collaborators with the channel. We love the products. We love the people. We love the culture. That's what we're going to be talking about. If you don't know who Tom Ross is, he is the CEO of Design Cuts, and he's also the host of the Honest Designers Show, a podcast. Tom, welcome to the show. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> I'm amazing. Welcome, Thank you so much, Chris. I appreciate woo -woo! you guys having me on. Look at that. We have the applause <laughs> of two people. Woo -woo! Okay. <laughs> there are people who are excited for you, Tom. I already saw in the chat, they're like, everything he says out of his mouth is gold. I'm not I sure. I can see that from Debbie. Love you, Debbie. You're the best. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are you packing the audience here with all of your super fans? <laughs> I can see some familiar names, but this is it, right? Community, they're showing up. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Everyone. Why don't we give a, a quick shout out to the people that are part of your community who's joining the future community? Who are they? Do you see them? Uh, I can see I can see some names. I can see uh, Be Kind Coca. I can see uh, Johannes. I can see Debbie. I can see a lot of people. To be honest, and because we work together quite a bit, like Design Cuts and the Future, I think we got a lot of the same people in the sea, you know, in the same communities. Chris, I noticed this. Yes, 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 and we're 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 grateful for you. We really are. There we go. <laughs> right back at So, you. Tom, I believe you have a. You just recently released a book on on community. That's why we're talking, and I think you've prepared a forty minute ish presentation for us to talk about community, the highlights, the insights, and. Not the low lights. I've ran out of lights. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, right. I am trying to share a bunch. And it's not just ideas from my book, to be honest. I break down how the future build community. So this might be a little Ooh. exclusive because Chris actually talked to me for this book. We're going to get into some Q&A afterwards. But you mentioned in one of your first slides, Chris, I think community is like the hot new buzzword. You see it everywhere, right? And I think a lot yes. of people, they don't fully understand what a community is. So right at the start of the presentation, I'm going to get to in a sec, I kind of help define an understanding of what exactly community is. Okay. Well, the presentation's ready to go. Incredible. All right. Let's jump in. Um, and everyone, you know, notepads at the ready. I want to make this as valuable as possible. And thank you so much for being here. So who am I? Chris, you just did a way better intro than I'm about to do for myself, but... As you said, I'm the CEO, I'm the founder at designcuts.com, the highest rated design marketplace in the world. And my personal brand, essentially my hobby in my spare time, I'm the community building guy. And I just love helping fellow entrepreneurs understand community and build incredible online communities. And when I started Design Cuts, you know, we had a very, very small team. It was myself and my business partners. We had no funding. We were entirely bootstrapped. We had no like capital behind us either, but what we had was an incredible product. So we had product market fit and really the secret source behind all of our early explosive growth was community. Community was at the heart of everything we built. And I was so just adamant that I wanted to build the most engaged online community that I literally made best friends with our first two, 300 customers. I was jumping on calls with them. I was connecting them with one another and it was just hands on relationship building at scale. And this is something I'm really going to break down in this presentation, but it's something I'm really, really passionate about. And to this day, you know, we've been going eight years and we get all of these incredible reviews. I actually had a meeting with my team earlier this week, just shouting out the amazing reviews that we see. And so many of them cite community as the reason why they're drawn to us. And I think fundamentally, you know, we don't want to be just another e-commerce website. We don't want to be this empty platform. And the same thing at the future, right? You're not just another educational platform. There's a ton of those. I think people are drawn to both of our companies because of the vision, because of the culture, because of the community and the people. And that fundamentally is some of the most powerful stuff when it comes to understanding marketing and what actually motivates people to show up. So community, there's a ton of benefits. 
And this is certainly not an extensive list. These are some of the main ones which we experience, but there are many, many more. So first of all, you're far more in touch with your members. You can understand them better. You can empathize better. You can anticipate their wants and their needs when you actually have a community versus if you're not really talking to your members. You can build with them. And so it's a great way to get very, very agile feedback when you have a community platform, a community space, because you can just go direct to your members and actually figure out what do they want, what do they need. And you can get feedback on new verticals, new product ideas. We do it all the time. Like literally we get feedback like on our logo even. And also you can get defended against haters. I mean, Chris, you don't get many haters. We don't get many haters. Everybody loves great, us. What are you talking it, about? I know yeah, we're just so universally us. popular <laughs> and, yeah. and so humble as well. That's what I love about this mess. So whenever the occasional <laughs> hater shows up, um, yeah. if you have a close knit community and like these true fans, they genuinely back you. And we've seen the occasional person kind of come in and try and spread negativity. And everyone's like, no, 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 not here. And they band together. And, you know, that's really, really great to know that you have that support. Also, incredible relationships. I mean, it's not just about the business ROI stuff. I love building relationships with our community members. I find it fun. It's literally like making friends with awesome people at scale. What's not to like about that? And then more on the business side, increased loyalty and retention. And there's so many stats and studies that back this up. Essentially, if you have an actual community, people generally stick around longer. They have more loyal buying habits. They engage more regularly. And they're going to be less likely to leave you for a competitor. So there's a lot of real tangible benefits. Those so are good benefits. I said at the start. Oh, go ahead, Chris. No, they're good benefits. I, I see the case that you're they making are. here. Yeah. Uh huh. And you guys experience them, you, you know, them too on a regular basis. I see it. I see people showing mm -hmm. up for you guys. They do. So and they do things like, for example, you don't have to promote your 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 upcoming live streams or your courses. They just happily share it with you unprompted. When we host the room, mm -hmm. they'll just put out on Twitter on Instagram, "This room's happening." And when you're doing the room, they share with other people to say, "You can't miss this." And then afterwards, they share one more time the highlights and their learning. Who would? I mean. Who, who would not want that and how much would you pay for that? And we just get it for free because of our community. And that's the magic. You can't pay for it. You can run ads and stuff, but like it takes years to build this stuff up. And I know you and I are both just immeasurably grateful. So grateful for what our community do for us. So I said at the start, there's a lot of confusion, I think, right now about like what constitutes a community. And I think oftentimes people are kind of referring to an audience when they talk about this stuff. Generally speaking, and you know, I will break this down in more detail, but an audience is one to many. So this is more of a broadcast medium. This is where you as the uh, you know, content producer, et cetera, you're putting out content and then the masses are consuming it. Whereas a more traditional community is more many talking to many. So it's some kind of environment or platform where members can talk to one another and interact with each other. And it becomes something bigger than just you kind of preaching at your followers. And so if we break this down, you can see that audience tends to be things, you know, like I say, social media. So YouTube, Instagram, maybe you've got a website, maybe you've got a blog. These are generally kind of more traditional uh, one to many audience platforms. On the other hand, you've got a lot of really, really fast emerging community platforms, things like Slack groups where people can hang out and network, uh, forums such as Circle, which Chris, I believe you're currently using, right, for the Future Pro. Yep, we're using Circle. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan, so I'm about to mm -hmm. launch a Circle community myself. I think it's an awesome, awesome platform. And then you've got some of the more well-known ones. So you've got stuff like Facebook groups, which can be highly effective, or Discord. Um, but there is an abundance, and there's more launching every single day. So there's a lot of kind of low-code or no-code platforms available for budding community builders. And there are pros and cons of both. So. If you're running an audience setup, then there's some definite pros. You know, you can reach a lot more people if you're on something like a social media platform. There's inherent shareability. People can extend your reach that way. And you're connecting with people on their native platforms. So this is where they actually enjoy spending the majority of their time. On the con side of things, you know, you can be very vulnerable to algor algorithm shifts. And I know. A lot of people say like, oh, the algorithm doesn't matter, just produce better content, but it's very real. And I have some incredibly 
talented friends running super big YouTube channels and Instagrams. And like overnight, their reach can just be cut in half and slashed. And that's pretty scary, right? That it's out of your hands. But the fact is, if you're running an audience on social media, you're on rented land. Um, and like I said, that's a risky position to be in. Uh, you also, you don't control the platform. And so this doesn't just extend to algorithms, but I know YouTube made some changes recently with what they're doing with ads. Um, you know, anything could shift around or change or worst case scenario, the platform could even go under, it could go out of business. And so again, you're on rented land, it's not something which is your kind of property. And then finally, you're competing for your followers attention. And social media, as we all know, it's a super busy place. You know, you've got everyone clawing at people's attention. It can be really hard to cut through that noise. Community, on the other hand, is very different because you control the platform. It's generally a platform which you've either paid for or you know, you've kind of integrated it into your space. And therefore, you have people's full attention. They are not getting distracted by loads of other people competing for their attention or, or posting content. Um, you know, you've got your full focus. There's no ads, et cetera, et cetera. And best of all, it provides a private intimate space for members. They get to hang out and in a closed community, often they feel, you know, able to open up more than perhaps in a public social forum. Cons though, there are definitely some cons. So it's harder to get discovered because often it can be kind of closed off from the world. There's no inherent shareability. And this is an issue. Obviously, you can promote it in other places, but it can't like catch fire and go viral typically in the same way a social media post could. And there can be a lot of friction. So most people spend their time on their phones, on social media, on Instagram or whatever, asking them to leave their favorite feeds and their favorite places to come over to your private closed community can be a really big ask. And this is one of the biggest struggles, you know, community builders see. So I have broken down in this presentation how to try and think of that and overcome it. But what we're looking at here is a very, very typical model and one that I see increasingly emerging in 2021. You have the big social media audience. Within that, you're going to have, you know, unengaged people. You're going to have engaged people. You're going to have your core community, your true fans, etc. your most engaged audience members. And they are the people typically that you're able to siphon off and then bring over into your closed community platform. So you're not looking to get your entire social media audience into a closed community platform. You're just going to kind of port across the most engaged people. And case in point, like at the future, Chris, you have millions of followers across your YouTube, Instagram, et cetera. But you definitely don't have millions of people inside the future pro community. I believe you just hit 500 people today, which is incredible. Uh, but the point is, you've actually siphoned off those really, really engaged, high quality individuals. Is that right? That's right. We are actually at 503 and growing. We're, we hope to get our yeah. numbers to 1,000 before and then to 2,000. So we have some big goals this year. I love that. And yeah, I saw that on Twitter earlier. Congratulations, man. Well Thank deserved. you very much. So in terms of these closed communities, you can generally split them into three camps. You got the free communities, you got the paid communities, and you got the freemium communities. And I'll give you three quick examples in the creative space. So Adobe, and again, I've seen so many of these launching like in the last 12 months, I really, really believe there's a fundamental shift that everyone's taking right now towards communities and close communities. Adobe launched this Discord server and out of their millions and millions of users, you can see they've got thousands of users in here, but it's really growing fast. And it's a great space where people can share work, they can get feedback, they can chat, they can get help with their Adobe software, et cetera. And this is a really, really great emerging community. It's free. As I just mentioned, the future pro community. This is a high-end, super high-quality paid community, and it's a great, great example of that. Like we just said, it's just hit 500 members and it's about to go to the moon, not like crypto, not in a roller coaster way, in a sustainable way. And this is a really, really good, good model. And I know, Chris, when we've talked about this, this is a big focus for you at the future right now. Yes, it is. It's my entire focus right now. And I see uh, <laughs> Johnny in the chat said, does that make us low quality individuals if we're not in there? It doesn't, Johnny. It makes you a high quality individual because you're here right now. And this is the point. Like, no one's low quality, but as a business, you need to realize you're always going to get people that might like have you on mute or they followed you four years ago and they've never seen your stuff since. They just don't care. So, you are definitely not one of those people, Johnny. You're someone that showed up. You know, you're part of the hundreds of people watching this live. That makes you one of, you know, the bottom of the triangle, one of the, the most high value, awesome people. 
So I hope that clarifies. Uh, and then final example, we have Retro Supply. This is run by my good friend, Dustin Lee, who I do the Honest Designers show podcast with. And he's been on the future as well. He crushed his session. And he launched this again, I think about six months ago. So he's part of the shift towards community. Um, oh, cool. We got Mathilde here as well from Circles Creator Community. Amazing to see you. Um, and this is a great example of a freemium community because you know large sections of it are available for everyone, but there is a premium kind of tier where you can only access parts of the community. So this is how you kind of can conflate those uh, paid and free models. And I know you're joking, Johnny. I can see you in the chat. Um, but what I'm really seeing at the minute is people are craving conversation, not just passive consumption. For the last 10 years plus, everyone's just been kind of thumbing through their Instagram feed or whatever it might be on social media. And I feel like particularly following COVID and this epidemic of loneliness, which has been widely reported on, people at large are just yearning for deeper connection. We, we lost interest a long time ago in these highlight reels on social media mindlessly scrolling through we actually want conversation and we want connection and humanity and relationships and you know this is one of the key reasons i think community is going to continue to emerge over the, the next decade so can a community exist outside of a community platform if we're talking about this kind of one to many and many to many and i think to an extent it can and a lot of the die hard community builders are like no you have to be strict it only constitutes a community if it's in this many to many setup and where I think this isn't entirely true is I think you can actually have a sense of community, even with an audience. And this can come down to several things. But as you can see here, it's a sense of belonging is one of the key uh, elements, I would say, of community. A shared sense of identity that people can buy into. Belief in a shared vision. And I'm going to break this down in case studies as well, because the future do an incredible job with their vision. And things like a shared vocabulary and inside jokes, et cetera. And the point is, so many companies, including mine, when we started, everyone was raving about our community. And this was long before we had our live events and our Facebook groups and our closed community spaces. People loved being part of the Design Cuts community, really because they bought into our vision. They loved how we treated them. And we talked all the time about how much we appreciated our community. And so really, the takeaway is community is more about the people than the platform. And it's not that one day you go from having zero community to flicking a switch on circle or something like that and boom suddenly you have a community it's more that those closed spaces can put your existing community on steroids it can give them a really really excellent place uh, to hang out and foster relationships so you might be wondering how do you pick your ideal community and really it's you know pretty simple but it's two things you need to figure out what platforms do your intended community members already use and what platforms do you personally resonate with and the reason you have to resonate with it is community building takes a lot of work. And if you don't enjoy using the medium or the platform, you are going to burn out. You won't be able to sustain the prolonged effort to build your community. In terms of you know choosing a platform based on where your intended community members spend time, this is all about friction. And to give you an example, if I was building a community tomorrow for gamers, I would absolutely establish it on something like Twitch or Discord because that's where gamers hang out. It would be nuts for me to start a Facebook group for them and expect them to leave their favorite native platforms they're familiar with to come and join my Facebook group. So really, you know, bear in mind those two considerations when you're starting your community. Next, you've got to think about value proposition. You have to answer the question, why should people actually want to be part of your community in the first place? And first of all, you know, we've got networking. This is one of the main four. This is a space for people to connect with each other and meet each other, create moments of serendipity. You've got information. You know, I would argue the future is a great example of this. It's a teaching community. You come to the community to learn, to get value from the teachers inside. Belonging. This is actually one of the strongest emotive triggers to be part of a community. And a great example of this would be religion. If you're going to the mosque once a week or the church once a week, it's a great environment to meet with like-minded people and have that shared sense of belonging and kind of be part of that same tribe. But of course, this extends to all kinds of areas. You could argue that Trekkies, fans of Star Trek, have a sense of belonging. When they're going to conventions and stuff like that, you know that you're amongst your people. And that's a really, really powerful thing. It's one of the most compelling value props for a community builder. And then finally, entertainment. 
you might just want to be part of a community because it's fun. Maybe you get to laugh there. Maybe you get to kind of make friends. And you can actually, you know, combine uh, different combinations of these value propositions. So in the case of the future, you know, I would argue it's perhaps largely informational. It's a teaching-based educational community, but there's absolutely opportunities for making friends, having that sense of belonging, networking, et cetera. So you can really hit on a lot of these in your community. And as I say, you need to answer these two questions. Why should someone actually want to join your community in the first place? And why should they stick around? If you don't have clear answers for these questions, you are really, really going to struggle. So it's imperative that you do the foundational work to figure them out. So let's talk about how to actually grow your community. Once you pick the platform, you've got the fundamentals down, you figured that stuff out. In my mind, there's four main triggers for community building. You've got one-to-one, -one, you've got word of mouth, got distribution and inbound. And I'm going to talk you through how to do each of these. So one-to-one -one is literally one-to-one -one conversations at scale. It's building relationships at scale. And it really frustrates me when people try and start an audience to start a community and they're just putting out content and they think it's like filled of dreams. It's not filled of dreams. It's not build it and they will come. And if you're finding you're not getting your people, you're not getting members, you're not getting very much engagement. What you need to realize is you need to go to them. Don't expect people to come to you, especially not early on. So you need to figure out who your perfect person is, who your ideal community member is, what they look like, and then go find them, figure out where they spend their time online, go to them, build relationships, join comparable groups and relevant groups and become a person of value and just build and build and build and talk to as many people as you can. That's a really controllable thing you can do at the start of building your community. Next up, let's talk about word of mouth. So think about some of the people and brands who you regularly refer. I would say generally they hit on two things. So quality and conviction. Quality is obvious. We only recommend stuff which is super high quality. But conviction is an interesting one because I would say that very rarely do people actually want to niche down or specialize, both things which, Chris, I know you talk about a lot, right? You're a big fan of specialization. What is yes, it? It's like a mile deep instead of like a mile wide. That would say. Yeah, it, it. Yeah, you 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 want to go instead of a mile wide and an inch deep, you want to go an inch wide and a mile deep, because by repeated one. exposure to something, you're going to get really good at it. You're going to be able to spot patterns, and intelligence is pattern pattern matching, pattern recognition. Mm -hmm. Yes, well said. So, here's an example of how this played out for me. Previously, I've been talking about community for years. I'm really passionate about it, but I was talking about all kinds of stuff to do with creatives and entrepreneurship. And it was only recently I pivoted and said, you know what, my main passion, I keep coming back to community. So I'm going to become the community guy. And what I did was I made a couple of announcements on social media. I kind of planted my flag. And almost immediately, I saw some positive momentum from this. My coaching inquiries picked up because people said, I need help with my community. My friends started referring to me and saying, oh, yeah, Tom, he's the community guy. Talk to him. People started making introductions and saying, oh, you should connect with this person. They're really you know, hot in the community space as well. And literally all I did was kind of have a bit of conviction about what I was doing. I stopped flirting with the idea of community and I decided to propose to it, to get married to it. And just by having that conviction, word of mouth spread and spread and spread. And this compounds over time. It's very early still for me in this direction, but I'm already feeling the benefits. And you have to think like most people, they're almost scared to have that much conviction. They don't want to go all in on a topic. I know people that have written a whole book on community, but they've written 20 other books about all kinds of stuff or someone that's done a whole podcast episode on community, but they got 300 episodes about all kinds of other stuff. So who would you refer? The person that day in, day out talks about the subject and is a specialist or the person who kind of dabbled in it 18 months ago? For me, the, the answer is pretty clear. And this is my new favorite saying, Chris, let me know if you've seen this before, but I'm pretty sure I came up with this. Maybe I need to copyright it, but conviction kills competition because most people aren't willing to compete at that mile depth. What do you think about that? I like it. I don't think I've heard it before. Cool. Okay. I'm feeling very profound then. I'll take it. <laughs> nice. So let's talk next about distribution. Distribution is key. And the reason it's key is because all of that other stuff matters. I'm still such a um, believer 
in terms of uh, actually let me stop for a sec so this is a good point axa in the live chat said it's not a competition it's about connection i completely agree i'm not here being like you need to cut anyone down all i'm saying is that you will differentiate you will stand out in a positive way by fully committing to something by planting your flag so it's not about like you know knocking down the other buildings it's kind of building the biggest building in in town in a sense by actually just going all in on something. So it's definitely in a positive way. But as I say, distribution is key. And the reason it's key is because it's so effective. Case in point, I did a guest newsletter for a friend of mine last year, and it took me a few hours to write. On the back of it, I literally got a thousand new email subscribers and members coming into my community. Those thousand people would have taken me so long to go out and find in the more manual relationship building way. So you definitely should combine these strategies, but distribution can be a great lever to pull on in terms of your community growth. And there are some very specific ways to do it. Most people do a blanket approach. So like, I'm just going to get my name out everywhere. I'm going to be seen everywhere. And that's going to raise awareness and, and bring people back to my community. I actually think you need to be a lot smarter about it. And so there's two things which I like to focus on. First one, when you're looking at audiences to get in front of is relevance. You need to find an audience that is super, super relevant to what you do. So I'll give you an example. Imagine you're trying to start a CrossFit community. If you got in front of a general fitness community, maybe only 5% of their members are actually into CrossFit. Maybe the rest of them are into like bodybuilding and powerlifting and Pilates and yoga, Zumba, Jazzercise. It's like, you know, it could be all kinds of stuff. And you're actually only going to reach 5% that are irrelevant. But if you did a distribution effort in front of a dedicated CrossFit community, you would know that 100% of their members would be into what you're talking about and would be hopefully suitable to actually come and discover your community. And then active audience. This is so, so huge. Chris, are you familiar with uh, Noah Kagan from OK Dog? I've heard of him, yeah. So he, yeah, he's the guy behind like AppSumo as well. And he said this really genius thing which sounds so obvious, but again, most people don't talk about this. He said, if you've got an email list of 100,000 people and only 10,000 ever open your emails, you really have an email list of 10,000 people. And this is what we're talking about in terms of active audience. It sounds so obvious, but everyone's always looking to do partnerships and work with people with the biggest possible audience. And I have this famous example I did where we did a partnership with an audience that had a million people and it fell really flat. It was super quiet in terms of the results. We did another partnership with an audience that had 5,000 people and it outperformed the million audience by 20x, meaning that on average, the 5,000 audience or community uh, rather, were worth 4,000 times more. And so it's like orders of magnitude different. And this all comes down to how active their community was it has nothing to do with the top level number of followers or metrics, et cetera. So I would really consider these two things primarily when you're looking for great audiences to get in front of. When you get in front of an audience, have a call to action. Otherwise, all you're getting is brand awareness. And that's great. But if you have a way to actually bring people back, for something of value, that's a highly effective strategy. So it should be something that's highly relevant and valuable for the audience, of course. And it should be something that's ideally a natural extension of whatever it is you're sharing or teaching. And the example I give here, imagine I was on the future right now teaching you how to sketch cartoon characters and you learn that for an hour. It would be great if I then had a free resource or something like that, where it's like, for the next step, you can grab my free resource for how to color in your sketches that you just did that converts so much better than something that's more generic. And then finally, make it something easy to get hold of. So something like an email sign up is super easy and low friction for people. And here's a bunch of distribution ideas. It's not an exhaustive list, but of course you can do things like guest blogs, guest newsletters. Chris, I know you often accept guest posts on your Instagram, for example. You know That would be a great yep. way to get distribution. And there's partnerships and on and on and on. But the main thing is you need to respect the hell out of these people's audience because they are letting you get in front. Right now, Chris, you're letting me get in front of your fantastic community here at the future. Hence, I wanna bring as much value as I possibly can. I deeply respect your audience and I just wanna serve and give and give and give as much as I can today. Well, and we appreciate you, Tom, we really do. Thanks, it looks man. like you've got the really tight presentation. I, I can tell from people who are writing in the chat, this is a really good com conversation, presentation in the community. You're going really deep, whereas people go wide, you're going really deep here. So we appreciate that. And I also want to say hello to everyone who's watching us live, all 342 of you. We've seen the audience grow and, and shrink and grow, and it's just really nice. It must mean you're doing something right, Tom. So I'll, I'll get out of your way. 
<laughs> no, I appreciate that. Thank you, mate. And I had to step up my game because when I came on here two years ago, I did my presentation using a default template on Keynote <laughs> and it looked horrible. So I was like, I need to design something. <laughs> I was like the wrong channel for that. Yeah. Shame. Shame on you. <laughs> shame. Let's go Game of Thrones. Okay. So um, I talked about this before, but you generally can filter down to the most engaged, most high value people within a community. And the beautiful thing is that when you actually do these distribution efforts and you do guest content and so on, by definition, you're generally going to be reaching their most engaged, most high value people. So right now we got hundreds of people watching live and there's going to be thousands watching after the fact. And the point is, these are some of the most incredible members of the future community. So I'm genuinely honored to be in front of you talking to you right now. Let's talk about inbound quickly. It's why the rich get richer. Chris, I guarantee you, like all of us, found this. With your social accounts, did you find that as you built momentum and you started to kind of hit a critical mass, it naturally just started growing faster and faster organically. But when you first started, it was really slow going, right? It's that traditional compound interest hockey stick thing, right? Yes, I can confirm this is true. Yeah, and it feels painfully slow at the start. It sucks. You're like, I'm not getting anywhere, but then it just picks up and it picks up and it kind of takes on a, a life of its own quite often. Yep. And the reason is, you know, important to understand this is it gives you the patience to stick at it through the early days but it also lets you realize that it will get easier as your community grows and this is for all kinds of reasons but for example when you've got more people in your community there's more people to actually talk about it and spread it via word of mouth and that kind of exponentially increases you get more social proof and credibility because no one wants to join an empty party when you've got zero followers or members so the bigger you are the more attractive you become as a value prop for people um, and i'll give you another quick example so it's not just about size of course it is about intention and at my company design cuts we noticed that a lot of people were into procreate a super fun bit of software and we thought well let's not just you know use distribution to get in front of wider procreate audiences and communities let's create our own so we created the procreate creative community it is now creeping up towards 10,000 members on facebook it's one of the fastest growing procreate community groups in the world and we don't do it we just create it and we moderate it but this is because there's people on facebook who are searching for procreate and then we're popping up in the search results as one of the main groups and they're discovering us that way. So we've got like a constant inbound organic interest happening for people to, to discover our brand and community. And that's really powerful. And again, that's a lot more scalable than just the hand-to-hand -hand combat, one-to-one -one relationship building. But in terms of these four strategies, I would use all of them. I would combine them. They're all powerful in their own ways. Hey, Tom, I have to read a so, super chat here. Yeah. Uh, let me just butt mm -hmm. in here from blau w blawa films our community is growing which feels fantastic but it's scattered our content covers a broad range of topics within the filmmaking pipeline tips on bringing the community together what do you think Ooh, interesting one so um i think when you're scattered you really got two options you can either pick one element of what you're doing and double down on it and kind of niche effectively and a good way of thinking about this is people generally won't have equal amounts of interest for all the moving parts of what you're doing. It's like the 80-20 principle. So you might find if you pick 20% of what you're focused on currently, you're still going to get 80 to 90% of your community who are super into that thing. And so by focusing, you're actually still going to serve the majority of them, but you're going to benefit from all the uh, you know aspects of niching. The other thing is you can just put an umbrella over all of it and have this kind of umbrella brand concept, which is going to be the thing that attracts people into your community. Does that make sense, Chris, about the umbrella? It does make sense. Please continue. Cool. Um, also, I saw Becca from the Happy Ever Crafter, who is amazing. So, hey, Becca. Um, so I want to talk about critical mass for a second. This is a really in on the back of a really interesting conversation I had with Dom McGregor, who is the co-founder of Social Chain, which is Europe's fastest growing ever social media agency. Super impressive company, now worth over 300 million. So he knows a thing or two about online audience and community building. And he explained that in all the history of doing it, they kept coming back to this number of around 200 people as a critical mass. And what he meant by this is that until you hit that point, you're going to have to be pushing and driving the community. You're going to have to be super active in there, making sure it doesn't fizzle out. 
because without you in it, it's going to die. But once you hit a critical mass, it means that you could step away, you could go on vacation, and the members are going to support each other. The community is going to become self-sustaining and kind of generative in terms of the content and interaction inside. And this is the position we all want to get to as community builders. So you may be thinking, okay, that's great, Tom, but how do I actually get to that point? How do I get to that critical mass? Because as Dom explained to me, it's important to get there as quickly as you can. You don't want like a trickle of people going in your community where you've got this empty party and there's five people in there and they leave because they get bored. So one of the best ways you can do this is something like a wait list. You can actually have a pre-launch. You can build some buzz and hype about your upcoming community. And before you open the doors, you ensure that you have those 200 or more people there. And you know, for the record, if you don't have 200 people there and ready to go, that's fine. There are, of course, examples of communities that are smaller and still very effective and close knit. But for the most, you know, majority of us, we want to try and work out what our critical mass is and try and hit it. So a wait list is highly effective. And not just a wait list of people saying, yeah, I'm ready, let me in when the doors are open. You know, they put their email into a form or whatever it might be, but you can take it a step further. So for the community I'm working on right now for my personal brand, I'm literally interviewing people. I've got an application process because I want to make sure that people are really going to stick around. They're kind of qualifying themselves. They're having to jump through hoops. So I know that when I open the doors, I've got a filtered group of people who truly want to be there and they're going to show up. They're going to engage and be incredible community members instead of me just like opening the floodgates to any old person. So let's talk for a second about nurturing your community. This is something I believe in so, so much. And uh, Chris, hopefully we're okay on time. I I have a lot to share on this, but I think 15 minutes. Is that good? Keep going. Yeah, we're good. Incredible. Um, and there's a lot of people here. This is cool. This is one of my favorite quotes ever. This is from a previous business mentor of mine, like over 10 years ago, Chase Reeves, great guy. And he said, you can either use your community or you can serve them. This was such a paradigm shift when I first heard this because generally everyone's in the business of using their community. They're using them to appease their ego. They're using them to get more likes or to monetize them. They're trying to just squeeze stuff out of them. Whereas when you shift into a service mindset, it becomes all about how can I do a better job for them? How can I show up and bring them more value? How can I learn more about them? How can I better understand them? It's like you're the concierge at a five-star hotel. You're trying to fall over yourself to actually just make your members as happy as possible. And this mindset really informs everything that I've done over the last decade. I believe there is magic in the unscalable. I love the fun of unscalable moments because they mean so much to people. And I'm going to give you a bunch of examples here. First of all, respond to everyone. Chris, when I interviewed you for my book, you said... To my amazement, you still get back to everyone personally across all your social platforms, which I found insane given your follower numbers. I try. It's getting increasingly difficult, especially with the in the release of shorts, because now we have a bunch of strangers mm -hmm. commenting and many comments are <laughs> yeah. worth res responding to. Yeah, we do have our trolls. We get it. You don't like me. Yeah. I, res I respect that. That's OK. <laughs> Find another channel that works for you. But yeah, I, I do try my yep. very best to respond to everyone. And it's very impressive, but it matters. And you shared with me that people write back and they're genuinely staggered. They're like, I can't believe you got back to me. I really appreciate it. And I've had the same thing. We get the same thing at my company. It really matters to people. They want to feel heard. The mindset I adopt with this is, I think when I've reached out to anyone that I respect and they leave me on red and I feel like a piece of crap, I'm like, oh man, that hurt. And so I never want anyone to feel like that. So that kind of mindset really motivates me to try and get back to every single message. And you can do this in interesting ways. You can channel the unscalable and create some magic. So Chris, this room may look familiar because I think you actually did a talk in here, like possibly right after me oh, yeah. in Birmingham. Do you remember right, that right. a couple of years ago? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was over 100 people in this room. And as you can see on the, uh, the screen there, I was talking about this stuff way back then. And I said to everyone, I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to show you how much I believe in this unscalable magic. I want everyone to get their phones out, go to my Instagram, send me a DM saying, prove it, prove that you're actually into this stuff. And so I did it, I finished the talk and I went and found a room somewhere on their university campus and I hold myself up, open my DMs. And then I had over hundred DMs from people saying, prove it in like aggressive capital letters. And I was meeting our mutual friend, Ian Barnard for dinner and a few other people. 
I was super late because it took me like two hours of being in this tiny room, sending personalized video messages to every single one of those hundred plus people. And I would call them out by name. If their name wasn't obvious, I'd go through their profile, figure it out. I'd send them a, a lovely personal message. Thanks for coming to my talk, et cetera, et cetera. And the response was insane. People wrote back, I can't believe you actually followed through. I can't believe you did this. And many of those people became really, really good community members. And they're still members of my community today. So it's super powerful. And some of you might be listening to this and thinking, OK, that's great, but that's really unscalable. That's a lot of work. Surely I can't do this kind of thing regularly. And I want to throw a little challenge your way, everyone. So think about this. How many hours each day do you waste aimlessly scrolling through your social feed? If you're anything like me, quite a few. And now our phone even gives us stats on this. It tells us how crappy we are in terms of you know <laughs> procrastinating and that kind of stuff. So imagine for a second that you used some of those precious hours to do gestures like the one I just described, to make an impact with your community. You'd be amazed at the incredible positive impact you can have with just one hour of your time here and there doing some nice gestures for people and blowing them away. How much better is that than just flicking through reels? This is a mindset which I actually train our team at Design Cuts to adopt. I call it the one community member mindset. So imagine this, you only have one community member, you only have one customer and they pay all your bills they support your family all of the comments all of the engagement comes from this one person that's it that's your whole community think how you would treat that person you would presumably make them your best friend you would deeply care about them you'd know every one of their wants and needs you would bend over backwards to serve them and i always say to my team i'm like try and get as close to that as you possibly can with every single member of our community and every single customer and trying to adopt that mindset at scale as much as you can. Next, you might be thinking, Chris, why is there a giant photo of the rock's head on your screen right now? And it's because of something I like to call value magnitude. So I'm a bit of a fanboy of the rock, and I'm pretty sure if he liked my Instagram photo, that I would probably giggle or freak out and get screenshot it, post it all over my stories, put it in a freaking frame and stick it on my wall and share it everywhere and tell all my friends. It would be pretty cool, right? But it would just take him a second. It would take a second of his day and it would like make my month. But for most of us, we are not like a super famous celebrity action Hollywood movie star. So we don't have the leverage that it takes to make that impact on someone with a second of our time. So what we need to think about is value magnitude. We need to actually give back more value than they give us at an order of magnitude greater than what they provide us with. So here's a, a quick example. Let's say a community member leaves a, a short comment on your Instagram post. You could respond to their comment, of course, we talked about that. Go to their profile and comment on three of their posts, super in-depth supportive feedback. DM them, thank them for their comment, figure out how to help them, engage with them and build an actual relationship, and then look for other ways to bring them value. And in a world where most people are flat out ignoring their communities and not getting back to people full stop, when you act like this, especially in those crucial early days, that's where people will gravitate towards you and will stick around because you're giving back more than anyone else in their universe right now. And yes, it's not scalable, but guess what? When most of us start out, we only have like three people showing up for us, one person showing up for us. These are the early people where you should be given back a value magnitude greater than what they give you. And then personalize and delight. You know, this is in the same kind of uh, realm as magic and the unscalable, but I just love these moments. So at Design Cuts, I remember one Christmas, I said, I want to do a video for all of the 500 designers that we work with, but I don't want to do a generic Merry Christmas video. We're going to blast out to all of them. I want to do a personalized video for each one of the 500. And so I stood there with Marco, our poor video guy, and he filmed me for three hours doing a personalized message, calling them out by name and wishing them and their families Merry Christmas. And I talked for three hours doing it. I lost my voice. And because unlike you guys at the future, we didn't have a fancy studio. I did this in the middle of our office. My whole team were just working quietly around me filming. And they hated me by the end of it because 500 times of hearing like, Merry Christmas, Chris, have a good one. Like they were going crazy. But when we cut up the videos and we emailed them out to everyone, the response was ridiculous. They were like, 
who does this? Your CEO sent me like a personalized Christmas video. This is ridiculous. And people lost their minds because most people don't operate in this way. So again, when you personalize and delight, there's real power in it for people. I want to talk about relationships. It's pretty common. You know, we all understand that relationships in real life take time. And this is actually an infographic. I don't think she knows I made this, an infographic of the relationship I have with my fiance. Because when we met, we were strangers, of course. Then we became acquaintances and then friends. And then we dated. And then we became a couple. And then we got engaged. And sadly, it's been delayed twice because of COVID. We're trying for the third time to get married later this month. And then we're going to be married and hopefully be very happy for the rest of our lives. Much to her chagrin, it took nine years to get to this point. And that's a long time. Yet everyone's acting online like they expect to get deep relationships building overnight or in the first month. Realize that community actually compounds and gets stronger and stronger as the years go on. So the connections you're building now, if you keep at it and you're consistent, they are just going to get stronger and stronger. And you're going to be in an infinitely stronger and better position in two years time, three years time, five years time than you are now. Be patient. Work at it. So how do you scale? You might be freaking out right now and being like, this sounds like a lot of work. You know, I need to actually scale or maybe your community is already there and it is a little bit bigger. You're like, how do I keep up with all of this? Well, first of all, I think you need to think about filtering your members. So I've talked a lot about this, but you will have the less engaged people and the more engaged people. And thank you everyone for the congratulations in the live chat. Can't wait. It's finally happening. Um, but yeah, you've got your highly engaged people. These are the people where you should be doing your super unscalable, personal, delightful, magical moments. With the less engaged people, you can do a bunch of the stuff I'm about to teach you. And it's still great. It's still going to bring them value. But you can't obviously be really hands-on and really unscalable with everyone, with thousands of people. So first of all, authenticity. I know it's like a real buzzword right now and everyone's throwing this word around, but authenticity is a great way. And there's tons of case studies in my book and they cite authenticity as one of the greatest ways they've been able to build that human connection and subsequently their communities. So let's make this practical. First of all, show all sides of yourself. Drop the filter and stop just showing the perfect stuff or the highlight reel. And Chris, I saw you did this really well recently, right? You actually did, I think, a, a tweet or a series of content where you were calling out your more negative attributes. It was like really, really impressive self-awareness. I try and do this as well. None of us are perfect. And you were like, here's some things that, you know, aren't, aren't so po polished and perfect. And what did it do, right? I guarantee people connected with you more after you did that. Yeah, they did. It's because when you are successful and things seem to be working out for you, you wind up being not so relatable. There's a good distance between mm -hmm. where people are at, your audience, and where you're at today. Because, you know, I'm 25 years into building and running a business. So th that's a pretty long and big gap. So when you talk about the things that most people don't talk about, where you're, you're not so proud, but, you know, there are parts of you. And then they, they then you feel like more of a dimensional person versus a cartoon character. So I want to yes, let people in. I love that. I want to let people know mm. who I'm about. And there, I have dark days. I have days where I don't don't feel that successful, and I'm, I and I struggle just like everybody else. I uh, have a chapter in my book where I talk about this, and I open up and I get really vulnerable. And then at the end, I'm like, "How much more connected to me do you feel than like the Lamborghini guy on YouTube ads?" You know, all these people who are like posturing and posing and trying to have the perfect life. Like no one likes that guy. No one relates to that guy. So, you know, the next couple of points here is like go deeper. I think that's super important. You just touched on that. And then be less polished. I think there's been a real shift towards things like uh, YouTube shorts and Instagram reels and TikToks because it's not like edited to death. It's more in the moment and people appreciate that authentic content. He's back again, Chris, the rock. He has returned. And it's because I want to talk about macro branding versus micro branding. This is a concept which I've come up with where macro branding is basically the top level of what you're known for. So in the case of The Rock, like he's a former pro wrestler. He's a Hollywood action movie star. But the micro branding is, in my mind, where the magic happens. This is where people actually connect with you and buy into you as a human. This is like your personality. It's the little idiosyncrasies which you open up and share with the world. And in the case of The Rock, you know, it's great that he's a, a movie star, but really why I connect with him is because I love what he shares about his work ethic. 
I love his crazy cheat meals that he makes, his brotherly banter with Kevin Hart, or how he's like super kind and generous with his crew and with his fans, and he gives so much of himself to them. It's all of these little moments, whether they're profound or silly, which actually let me connect with him and his personal brand. And we can all do this. I find this all the time. Whenever I open up and share a little piece of myself with my community, that's the stuff that actually gets the most response. If I play a bit of guitar or piano, I get dozens of messages saying, oh, I play too. I love this. Like I play the piano. I'm learning. Or if I share me walking my sweet golden retriever, Dakota, people start sharing photos of their dogs. And so don't just be a business card. Don't be a label. Don't be a job title. You are so much more. You can actually open up and share that you are a multifaceted, multidimensional person. Going live. How meta is this, Chris? But this, what we're doing right now, this is inherently, this is a scalable way to build community and, and bring value to people. We're talking to a lot of people, hundreds of people right now. Going live is a great way to build community. And arguably, I'm sure you find this, it has more propensity for connection than just like an edited video that you stick up and wait and see what the comments is. Like we're able to respond and kind of get a, uh, a read on the room. Yeah, you know, recently I saw you join in a clubhouse room, which I don't see you very often, and they were talking about community. And there's something that's very alluring about being on clubhouse, which I want to articulate and to tie it into the concept of being live. So when we're seeing a, a video on YouTube and it's not live, there can be scripting. Somebody can be reading off a teleprompter. Uh, there can be setups, which you're not aware of, and then a lot of editing that happens afterwards to delete and remove all the parts that they don't like. That's natural. That's just called editing. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not trying to throw shade on that. But when we're having a live conversation like this and you're tuning in live with us, everybody that's watching, you never know what's going to happen. Tom may get bothered by something and he might want to yell at me or he might say something <laughs> super funny. It may not be appropriate for all audiences. And then we edit it out. The whole point of live is the true characters revealed. And that's what's happening. Yeah. Right. So you can't hide behind who you are. You're going to say what you're going to say and you're going to do what you're going to do. And then I think people appreciate that. Yeah, and I go live all the time now, so I feel pretty comfortable. But there's like his his being authentic, right? There's been a couple of moments where I've like fumbled my words slightly, like very small amounts. And I don't really do that anymore. But I think it's because I'm aware it's not how many people are here live now, it's like how big the future channel is. And I guess that's in the back of my head. But does that make the value I share less compelling? Does that make me less professional? I don't think so. I think it makes me a human being. And it's to Chris's point of like, share all sides of yourself and you can actually be vulnerable. So yeah. next, oh, sorry, Chris, go ahead. I got, a, I got a question. There's another super chat question mm -hmm. here from MD Gashkar. Um, the, the gist of the question is, he, he seems like MD has a pretty decent following, but MD is getting really low engagement, relatively speaking, on LinkedIn and even uh, on YouTube. Uh, what, what, what are some tips you have beyond what you've already said, if if you have a channel, if you're posting, uh, MD says he, the company has 15,000 followers on LinkedIn, but it's only like yep. 20 or 40 comments. What can you do to drive engagement? Okay, so first of all, I would say that doesn't actually sound terrible. You have to realize that most people are lurkers. The algorithm won't show your content to many of them. So I would actually be super grateful and connect with those 15 to 20 comments. I'm actually about to write a whole blog article on this. So this is very serendipitous timing, but I think what you need to do is you need to filter down your people and you need to in engage with them. So if you had 500 followers, I would say reach out and private message all of them and start a conversation and be like, I appreciate you following, how can I help you? You can't do that with 15,000. So what you need to do is you need to actually look for the people that have indicators of fanship or indicators of engagement. And then you need to go and actually one-on-one -on -one talk to them and build relationships and you will see your engagement spike. So there's different ways of doing this. Like I say, if you've got 15, 20 people commenting, I would start there. Let's say you had no comments or even less comments, then I would look at the people who were liking your posts and let's say that's maybe hundreds. I would go and message those hundreds of people. And this is something I'm actually doing right now with some of my coaching students. So there's people that have comments and they start there and build relationships there in a manual capacity. There's people with no comments, but they have a hundred people liking every single post. And so they start there, they outreach and talk to those people. Thanks for liking my content. I hope it helped. Anything you want to see from me in the future. When you start having conversations with 50 to hundred people on a regular basis who are already engaging with your content, you will find they start showing up and engaging a hell of a lot more. And that's how you can start to kind of breathe life back into your community.
there are other tactics, but I would start there. I hope that helps, Chris. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Cool. Um, so answer one, answer many. This is so perfect. I don't know if you deliberately planned that, Chris, but I just answered a question for one person and hopefully anyone else here who was wondering about that thing got an answer too. So again, it's a more scalable <laughs> it worked way to actually really bring well. value. That was perfect. <laughs> a little bit of serendipity there. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, I have a question for you. You're a pretty smooth sure. speaker, I've, I've noticed, and you're able to do a presentation while somehow miraculously reading the comments and not missing a beat. Does this have something to do with your English background? Um, no. Well, maybe, but truthfully, it's just practice. And I know you've had the same thing doing this channel. You are so slick now compared to video number one. And the truth is, like growing up, I was a horrible speaker. I was pretty inarticulate and actually I just got nerves. So I remember having to go and give speeches at school. My hands would be shaking. I would just look like the least confident person on earth. It was terrible. But guess what helped with that? I've now done about 500 podcast episodes. I must have gone live 400 times with my company, sometimes up to like 2,000 people. And I've just done it over and over and over again on my Instagram. I did a series a few years ago called Daily Tom, where I forced myself to pick up my phone and just record a video in one take, no matter how bad it was and hit publish. When you do that over and over again, it's like muscle memory and it gets so much easier. So like I got a bit of nerves right now. I'm also partly getting heat stroke because it's so hot here in the UK. So I'm like trying to multitask <laughs> and not die. But like it, it gets more comfortable. That's the point. And I've talked very publicly about this, like even past school, when I did my first Instagram video, it took me one hour, Chris. I sat on my bed for an hour. I did a hundred takes. I'd record five seconds and be like, no, I look like an idiot, delete. No, people are going to judge me, delete. My team are going to make fun of me, delete. By the time I published that 30 second video, I felt like I'd run a freaking marathon. It was the most exhausting thing in my life. But fast forward like five years and I can jump on live with you and I feel pretty comfortable apart from the heat stroke. <laughs> Very nice. See what Tom just did there? He revealed something, a character flaw, something that he's worked on, how he's overcome that. And by revealing that to you, you onboard or you bring in people into your community and say, wow, one day I too can speak so smoothly like Tom. Well, thank you, Chris. And thank you for all the kind comments. And to be honest, I still get like particularly nervous in person because I haven't done it as much. I've done, I think, four. <coughs> Literally, this is the funny thing, Chris. I was like, I'm, I'm going to be like Chris. I'm going to start doing a bunch of public speaking. That's going to be a real pillar stone of my uh, career and then COVID happens like right as it started picking up and I started <laughs> started getting speaking gigs so that is the next thing to tackle I want to feel comfortable going and speaking to like 10,000 people in a room somewhere um, but anyway back to community so as you scale you can and should elect leaders and mods you will see these people kind of self-identifying every community has people that are particularly engaged and particularly helpful these are the people that you actually want to empower and you want to give them added responsibility so give them a title give them some you know responsibility in your community and you will see them thrive and flourish and actually let you scale out your vision and hire help you know moderators are great but they tend to be more part-time there are so many jobs right now emerging in the space of community. Like I say, community is the future. And I see an explosion of like community manager jobs and all kind of community related jobs. Um, Dave Tallas, in fact, Chris, I, um, I worked with Dave and I encouraged him to hire a community manager and he has never been happier because he's like, I couldn't keep up. And now she does such an awesome job. I can step back and look more strategically at my business. So it's fantastic for me and the community. That's great scaling your vision this uh, you can see here here i am with my incredibly skinny looking head with my buddy tama who is actually or was in the live chat um and we are hugging next so chris this was the year i met you for the first time in person oh. you came and were very polite and had a nice chat with me and i was very drunk by the elevator and had to put myself to bed but it was very nice to meet you and you remember <laughs> mike mike jones the uh <laughs> Mike Jones, the organizer of Creative South, his whole slogan for the conference is hug next, right? Like grab strangers right. and give them a big old bear hug. And that really translates to the code of contact and the culture at Creative South. It's the warmest conference I've ever been to. And it stems from Mike's vision, which gets adopted by the yeah. community members. Now, Tom, you're a pretty tall guy, right? 
<laughs> yeah, I I think I was like stooped there because I'm actually taller than oh, Tama. You... He's not like a giant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you make him look like he's seven foot four. Because next to me, yeah. I'm like a midget so next broad, to you, but I'm tiny, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, is yeah. that Jonah coughing in the background? Is that your your team no, that's member, me. Tom? Yeah, sorry. Jonah, you can put mute. You can hit mute, <laughs> oh, can't you? I didn't realize that. I was that's right. Jo this join yeah. the party, Jenna. <laughs> we just keep you hearing sneezing and coughing. Like, come on. All right. COVID. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Keep going. <laughs> um, all right. So we're nearly there, people. Stick with me. So make them feel welcome. It is so imperative that people get a pleasant onboarding experience when they join your community. Otherwise, they're just going to bounce. They're not going to stick around. So here's a few ways to do this. You kind of, of course, have a pinned welcome post. I believe you probably have something similar in your circle community, Chris, like a pinned video or intro yep. message or something like that. Yep. Um, yep. yep. Have fun with it. So one of my favorite entrepreneurial communities I used to be a member of, after you joined and signed up, they didn't take you to a dry page being like, thank you for signing up. Maybe you could consider starting here. They actually had an animated GIF of the founders letting off balloons and like having a party in your honor. And I thought it was the coolest thing ever because it was so different and it was so fun. So get creative. You know, your audience are a creative bunch. Don't be lazy with the onboarding. Really think outside the box. You could, uh, of course, use an email follow-up sequence where you can drip feed and kind of hold their hand that's the whole principle of this you make it clear just week on week you tell them what they should be doing and guide them to the appropriate places and how to get the most value from your community you could have a start here post and uh, this is more applicable to things like blogs if someone discovers your blog and they're really overwhelmed where do they start it's like cool direct all roads lead to this one page where it's like takes them by the hand again and walks them through and then facebook groups this is a cool hack actually that was taught to me by jillian and jordan who run lovely loops who have an incredible lettering community they do a thing where you can actually uh tag up there's a feature in the sidebar of facebook groups where you can tag personally the last hundred members to join your group and if you do this periodically, you can have this giant tag cloud and welcome everyone by name. And they all get an individual personalized notification, which brings them back in the group. And then everyone's saying hi and you get a real conversation going. So that's a really good Facebook group tip. Build with your community. I love doing this. Like literally we check everything with our community. I do it with my personal brand. We do it at Design Cuts. If we have a new idea of like, oh, we're going to try this new model out. What do you guys think? We have a, a rebrand coming up and we're actually going to run it by our community rather than just rolling out at scale. We're going to be like, what do you think? Have you got any feedback? We do it with everything. So get into the habit of over asking and actually involving your community. Make it more interactive. Don't just impose stuff on them. Get their feedback. Let them help shape your community. Set the tone and rules. This is like slightly more boring, I guess, but it is necessary. You need to obviously attract the right kind of people and eschew the wrong kind of people. And rules and guidelines are a great way to do this, just to have a reference point where you can point to it and say that kind of behavior is not really acceptable. That's not what we stand for in this community. And then <laughs> this, I, Chris, can you clarify, is it futurists? Is that your future members? Yes, we call ourselves futurists. We also refer to ourselves as donuts. <laughs> I like that. And uh, I feel like there's another one. Like your master dough and you got the doisms. I feel like <laughs> there's, there's another doisms. one. There's daily yeah. dose. Welcome to the dojo. This is the donation. See? I'm Jonah Doe. I need to get a better name. <laughs> the only one I got was Ross Buses. I'm like, damn. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So Jonah, what are about. you saying in the peanut gallery there, Jonah? What the heck are you saying? I'm saying I'm Jonah Doe. Just taking those, all of those. <laughs> yeah. Jedi. Okay. We'll work on I you. Um, yeah. The cutters. Please no, do. If you work. have an idea. Yeah. Futurists, Donuts, all you guys. I need a good community <laughs> name because I, I believe in this so much. And like, it sounds perhaps kind of dumb, but the best we could come up with at Design Cuts was Design Cutters. But guess what? It's not about how perfect the name is. It's just having a name that people buy into. And now people all the time, they're like, yeah, I'm a design cutter. Welcome. You're a design cutter now. Really, really powerful. Again, it creates that. Um, that much valued sense of belonging. Gary V, I know now it's known as the Vayner Nation, which has a typo in. It's not Vayner, it's Vayner Nation. My bad. Um, but in the early days, they were called the Vaniacs. 
and I love that. Like I, I often think the best uh, names like Chris just demonstrated, they're a kind of merging of a clever concept that indicates fandom combined with a person's name. And ideally it should capture their essence. So Vaniacs is perfect because Gary's like super high energy. So it's like maniac, Vaniac, super clever. Hooligans, this is the name for the fans of Huel, which is a food supplement business. And holy God, the biggest moth in the world just flew in the room and landed on my lap. That's freaking me out, but I'm going to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got <laughs> Steph Lund. It's because I got my window open because it's so hot. And then Steph London, she's a London, UK based rapper. And she calls her fans the Dons again. It's a play on her name. But she shouts out her Dons all the time. She shows love to the Dons. And again, people self-identify. It's one of the most powerful things about community where they say, yeah, that's me. I'm a Don. I'm a donor. I'm a futurist. I'm a master do wannabe, whatever it might be. Um, it's a really powerful tactic. And uh, um, um, I have to say, of the four examples, yeah. we need to work on yours a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, <we do. laughs> It's not goofy enough. That's a problem. <laughs> It needs to be good. Yeah, I want to goof it up. I'm, I'm accepting yeah. all ideas. I, I want your okay. 20 plus years creative experience, Chris. Let's let's activate the community here. All 323 of you, I believe in group intelligence mm -hmm. and crowdsourcing. Um, I'm sure Tom will give you something amazing and fantastic beyond his respect and appreciation. Whoever comes up with the winning name, please contact Tom directly. He will give you a fabulous prize. I yeah I would love that. Um, anyone that gives me the best name, I will give you uh, five hours of Chris's cons consultation time. It's very kind. <laughs> it's very expensive, Tom. I'm I'm glad you're going to buy that for them. <laughs> okay, you heard right, it here. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, we are, damn it, I've dug a hole for myself. Um, yes, you did. We are nearly there. I just wanted to wrap up by showing how you guys build community. And Chris, I know you featured okay. in my book and you were very generous sharing that, but I've broken it down in visual form here. So how did the future build community? Well, mm. to be honest, all kinds of ways, but here's some of the, the highlights for me. Vision and mission. When we chatted, Chris, you talked about what a fundamental difference this made to the engagement in your community. When you laid out that one billion minus one mission, people really bought into it and they took that ownership and they proudly shared that they were one of the billion that you're helping. And so, you know, the same way we talked about Hug and Next at Creative South, I think it's such a great community strategy. Extreme quality. Again, I break this down further in the book, but Chris went really in depth with how seriously the future take the quality of their content. And honestly, you guys excel at this like more than anyone I know. It's super polished, super high production, incredibly valuable. Um, and this really sets you apart. And the fact that you just give and give and give without asking for stuff in return, I think that's been fundamental to building your community. Openness and vulnerability, talked about this before. Chris owning his full self, sharing that self-awareness, being very open. You know, you have your personal brand. People know you. They know your team. They're connecting with Jonah, Coffin, and freaking out behind the scenes. Like, people love you guys, right? Because you're awesome, and you open up, <laughs> and it matters. Sorry, Jonah. I'm calling you out. Um, and then badges. I thought this was very clever. So you create these badges, and people can kind of get them attributed to them when they're part of the future pro group. And people have actually started sticking their face in front of the badge and using that as their social media avatar. So not only is this saying like, I'm a future head, I'm a future pro group community member, but they can actually spot each other out in the wild. So I'd imagine members are out there being like, oh, you're a member too. And it's the same way I talked about before, right? We got the, I struggled there, the Trekkies. You can see each other a mile off or the Harley Davidson bikers, whatever it might be. Oh, that's very, I'm not, I'm not going to attempt that one. That's too hard. But you know what I mean? Like people can actually see that identifying sense of belonging in a visual way. I think that's super, super smart what you guys did there. And then here is like an overall look at a lot of what we talked about in this presentation. So you do a bunch of stuff in terms of inbound content. You do podcasts, you do your blog, you obviously do your YouTube and your Instagram and so on. You do speaking gigs, clubhouse partnerships, and all kinds of other distribution efforts. All of these people then discover the future. They become part of your audience, part of your wider community. You boil down into the core community of true fans. And then these are the 500 and soon to be 2000 people in the future pro community, you siphon them across and give them that incredible space to interact. That is it from me. Again, many of the ideas in this presentation were taken from the book, which is even longer, believe it or not, 175 pages and features 30 case studies from incredible people 
like Chris, Mike Janna, and many, many others. Chris, thank you again for being part of that book. Your case study was actually one of my favorites. And thank you so, so much, you and the entire team, for having me on today. It's been a blast. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you, Tom. And for those that are visually impaired, where can they go to download the book? Uh, the book is available at communitymanual.com. Um, and it's been really humbling, to be honest. I only launched it recently. There's been thousands of people getting it, and it's completely free. I put it out there. I want more people building communities and helping others and caring about people. I really hope this book has a very positive impact on people. Beautiful. And how can people find out more about you, Tom, out on the social uh, social media internets? Uh, so I'm at Tom Ross Media on most socials, and my website is tomross.co, which is .co, which it turns out is the worst um, domain for any email address because anytime I use it with anyone outside of like the online space, they're like, you mean .com? And no one understands .co, but that is a random <laughs> aside. <laughs> yes <laughs> you got to get a dot com that's the that's the gold standard right now well it's time it is time for us to do a little q and a so let's open it up Yay. to people in the chat um tom why don't you do this you're very good at reading your own questions so why don't we do that okay you go ahead and oh man i'll try questions all right let's do this together I'll try with you. All right, hit me so up. if you have a question for Tom about uh, building community, a vulnerability, uh, how you can get your own set of raving lunatic fans. True fans. <laughs> true yeah. fans. Authentic, true fans. Yes. All those people. Go ahead and ask us the question in the chat and we'll do our best in the next few minutes to, to try to read them and, and to answer your questions. I'm going to go back in time now and look for a good question. Maybe Jonah Amazing. has one. Jonah, and, do you have one for yeah, us? Yeah, I, I have a couple. Um, okay, go ahead. Oh, cool. like, Clouds like these asked, do you think paid communities communities can work for news slash media sites that don't sell products or courses? Yes. Yeah. I, mean, I don't want to oversimplify this, but you'd be amazed. I think communities are the future in general, but I think they're the future for virtually every kind of business. And interestingly, in the book, I didn't just talk to people like Chris. I got a plethora of different individuals and companies, and the rules around community are pretty ubiquitous. So I think, again, it's about defining the value prop. Why should someone actually show up? And why should they stick around? But I could absolutely see it working for that model and indeed many others. There were some freaking... <laughs> there were some random case studies in the book, guys. There's one which is a community predicated around il an illustrated frog, believe it or not, over at Rainy Lynn. It's got like 2,000 paying members around an illustrated frog. So if the awesome Rachel behind Rainy Lynn can start that, I'm pretty sure you can start it around some kind of news outlet or informational community. Beautiful. Okay, let's keep standing for questions. I love the way that you said that that Tom and we're gonna have to cut this from the broadcast to little clips I don't know if you guys have noticed on our future channel they rolled out clips uh, for a few channels and you can do this where you can use that scissor icon and grab something from the channel it's well within your copyright use and it actually gives us credit every time it's seen so that's one thing that I want to do to empower and to activate our community whenever you watch one of our videos and you see something that you like and you want to save it for later don't add it to a bookmark don't try and save it somewhere else just use the clip feature inside of YouTube and it will allow you to save um, segments from videos that you like. Now, what I love what you said there, Tom, was communities are the future. And that, to that, I have to say thank you. That, that was very on brand. <laughs> <laughs> I should just write that clip. Uh, you're giving value, Chris. I just wrote that clipping technique to tell my team because I actually didn't realize yeah. that. Um, do you mind if I read Katya's question? Because Katya is awesome. Yeah, I really please. like her and she has a good one. So, um, Katya says, tips for hiring good community managers. Uh, I've tried multiple remote Ooh. community managers, um, and they're never, and I've never really found a good balance between a good engager and good at sales. I think you're making the common mistake, um, Katya, which is actually um, like ardent community builders speak out about this. I think because community is becoming a bit of a buzzword, much like in the general marketing space, we kind of conflate roles and we expect someone to do it all. And that's actually not the right thing. So it is not a community manager's job to sell. That is your sales team job. Community is all about nurturing the community, fostering those connections, trying to elicit feedback from them and feed that back to relevant departments. And of course, they can work hand in hand with sales departments and people, but you shouldn't really be pushing or expecting your community manager to be there selling for you. That is a very different role. So I wanted to draw that distinction. 
I also want to say hi to Katia. I, I've spoken to Katia before, so hello. Uh, there's a bunch of really good questions here. So the next one's going to come from C. Vandenberg. Does asking people to pay money make people more loyal, Tom? Yes, I would say, <laughs> in my experience. So, <laughs> you wanted to say no, but you had to say the truth. You had to it's tell the, the truth. It's right? the truth. It's the truth. So what it is, it's just another filter. And... <laughs> Like I, so I'll put it this way, right? We have some amazing free communities as part of Design Cuts. What I'm working on right now for my personal brand is going to be a paid community. And it's not because I'm looking to like get rich or something like that. It's truly because of a filter because I've experimented with a bunch of free communities before. And what happens is you open the floodgates, you get an average lower quality of member. And I don't mean they're a bad person. I mean, like on average, you'll see lower average engagement from members you will see more spam you'll see lower retention and the fact is when you pay for something you have a higher level of commitment and chris will you know i'm sure attest to this with the future pro community people are paying a reasonable amount to be in there and so they're going to be much more likely to put in the work and continue to show up and you will be attracting your idol audience persona in that community versus just like anyone and everyone which i think can be dangerous ground so you know i am a believer in free and paid and freemium communities. Um, but I think in answer to your question, Steve, it's like 100%, it adds that filter, it leads to a higher quality of uh, commitment and membership. I want to add something to this. It's like, the thing that makes us as a community is we have a shared worldview. We feel like it's us, sometimes versus them. I know it's not about competition, but we we share something and there's something that makes us different from everyone else. And when you totally open it up, that specialness, that exclusivity is lost. Now think about this. When you hear about a band, like a really cool band that's plays in a really small venue, you feel really special because it's you and maybe 50 other people in this little dive bar that's hearing this band for the first time. And you feel a deep connection to the band. What happens when the band starts to blow up and starts to go on tour? And then everybody, including your mom is talking about this band. The band hasn't changed, but your relationship with the band has changed. It feels like, like now you're sharing the band with so many more people. So that specialness, that deeper connection now is lost. And what do you say? You don't say congratulations, band, for being successful. And, it, <laughs> it, you know, you, you, you've you earned it. This is your moment. Take it. You say what? You say the band has sold out. So think mm -hmm. about that. So there is a relationship between the size of the community and how connected you feel to that person or that community okay tom i want to ask you this question and I, then like I have it. a prop i almost forgot here's the question this is coming from me what's the yeah. weirdest or most memorable or unique thing that somebody from your community has done for you out in the wild or sent you or done with you for you something weird tell us a funny weird story okay this is very uh relevant i can show you i have it right here so I mentioned Tama before. You remember Tama the giant yes. uh, in that photo? So yes. um, Tama's awesome. And I did a bunch of value magnitude with Tama and many others. He was there at start with my community. And what I did was I didn't just like respond back and comment back and DM a bit. I actually picked seven people in my early community and I appreciate, appreciated them showing up f before anyone else did so much. that I said, right guys, I'm gonna give you free coaching every single week and I did that for seven months, completely free. The giant moth's flying in now, I'm gonna ignore it. And so I did that and I kept showing up and I kept showing up and I made some incredible friends and some great fans in that midst and I love those people dearly. And after bringing so much value, about six months to a year later, I'm in my office with my team and I'm sat there and this giant cardboard box shows up and I'm like, what is that? And they're like, oh, it's for you. I'm like, okay, I open it up and inside, I find a Gibson Les Paul guitar, Cherry Sunburst, exactly my perfect guitar. And I remembered six months previously, I'd had a conversation with Tama talking about, I wanna buy this guitar for myself, maybe when I'm like 50 years old and I retire, you know, I'm holding out for this thing. He remembered that and six months plus later, he sent it to me. And there was no note, I had to ring up the guitar company and they're like, yeah, it's this crazy guy in Texas sending you guitars. And I'll get it right now, bear with me. Look at that thing. And this is on my wall. Every time I play it, every time I look at it, I'm reminded of Tamar's kindness and he's the sweetest guy in the world. 
but in a more holistic sense it reminds me like what happens when you show up and you do good for people and i recommend everyone in the book read chris's case study because he's had some very similar instances of just crazy acts of generosity which come because he's given and given and given so much of himself tom 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 before you go uh, uh, before yes. you put that guitar away can you play something for us on the guitar or not oh man is that an electric not guitar plugged in. oh okay okay uh, is it in tune <laughs> I, I can't do this with the future numbers that are showing up yes you, yes you can <laughs> Is that picking bring up? Bring it closer. Even? Bring it closer. It, I can barely hear it. I like what I'm hearing. Just oh, bring it closer man. to the mic. You could do it. Yeah, I'm not standing up. I'm wearing sweatpants right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right. Don't stand up. Can you hear that? Yes. Yep. It's kind of out of tune, but you get the idea. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. The, the, the trick is, it's a much better guitar than I am a guitarist. <laughs> <laughs> I want to share two quick stories. Uh, and, and maybe if you have another one to share with us in terms of this idea. I believe that there's this thing called karmic equity. There's karma and equity is like currency and you trade in the currency of karma. And that the more good mm -hmm. you do in the world, the more your account swells and it grows. And you never have to take anything out. And every once in a while, it comes back to you. And I want to tell you, I was at the design conference in Brisbane and it was the last day. And I was thinking about getting um, getting a cab or an Uber or something to get myself back to the airport. I had to leave a little bit early. This young man who, who spoke to me earlier that day had seen me and, and it looked like, you know, I'm ready to go because I have my luggage and everything. He says, what are you doing? I said, I got to go catch an airport or, or I got to get to the airport here. And he goes, um, do you mind if I if I take you? I said, no, I, I couldn't impose. It's just too much. He goes, no, it'd be my pleasure. So here's a young man who I've never met before who's watched some of our video content and has a connection with what it is that we've done that he would go out of his way. He was working the event, but he's like, I'm just finished. If you give me two minutes, I'll wrap up. And I'll get out of here and I'll take you to the airport. And I'd just love to spend time talking to you. Normally, I would not get in a cab like that because I have trust issues, but I, I felt good <laughs> about this man. We got in the car and, and he was just like, this has made my day. I said, you've made my day. What are you talking about? So that's just one quick that. story. And I have something right behind me that I'm going to bring up. Okay, so let me grab this. Oh, show me. Yep. Also, I'm check out Chris's plant. Yet. That's a nice plant. <laughs> Thank you. What is that? It's a Monstera, I believe. Uh-huh. No, no, I mean, Which what's I the like? thing you're holding? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. Hold on. <laughs> I'm going to show you. <laughs> I have to set up the story, man. I just can't do just... <laughs> I'm sorry. So, I meet somebody via Instagram and he's chatting with me. He's like, I really love that room that you're running. This is what I do. I'd love to help you in any way and give value. He's a neuro-linguistic programming um, trainer and expert. And we've been doing some calls together. He said, I love this. First of all, he's 27. I'm almost 50 years old. So it's like a father-son relationship. He's very wise for his years. But he's like, I got something for you. So he sent this to me recently. And he describes the relationship as, you know, you're, you've always re referenced the karate kid. So you like, you're Mr. My, you're my Mr. Miyagi. So this is what he had made for me. Can you see this? It's a uh, wooden what? plaque. This is like that legit is so carved dope. with our logo. It says Miyagi Do and karate. It, it, how cool is that? You guys with That's the future logo in the That's back. That's amazing. Come on. Karate kid. Cobra That's Kai. Amazing. I love that show and I love that gift that I, I, I feel like we'd be here all day at this rate, but can you see on top your of turn? Myself? Go get it. Just go get it. All right. Ignore the sweatpants guys. I didn't yeah, think no I'd be problem. standing up. I'm wearing like a dress shirt and sweatpants. <laughs> all right. So one, one of my community made this for me where it's like this delightful personalized message. And she did like a super lovely handwritten message on the back. Amazing. Oh, can you hear me, Chris? Just checking. Yeah, I can hear you. No, I'm just listening. Yeah, I'm leaning in. We got Johannes in the chat. Mm. Did this hand painted work of art. I can see him That's there. Cool. Amazing. Love this thing for our birthday. We got the letters back there from Debbie, who's also in the chat. These DC letters for design cuts, incredible. Renee's in the chat. Like, this is so meta. 
my laptop right now, I actually showed her this earlier, is rested on a box, which I love and look at every day. It's one of the original lights from the first Las Vegas sign. And Renee's based in Las Vegas. And Chris, I don't know if you agree. For me, like this is the metric, if you want to call it that, which I care about the most. Like it's not how many likes I get on Instagram. It's that if you have enough impact and a deep enough relationship and a strong enough community that people are sending you incredible gestures and gives, that's a really good sign that you're doing something right, in my opinion. And I know you get this stuff all the time. We've talked about this. Oh, we're not done yet, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> so I was in Amsterdam at awards and somebody said, you know, uh, a friend of ours couldn't make it, but he had a very special gift. We all have to present it to you. I believe they're Ukrainian or Russian or something like that. I'm sorry. I'm forgetting parts of the story here, but he had made me look at this. A <laughs> custom Lego guy. Look at this guy. He looks just <laughs> like me. I can't believe it. With That's special packaging and everything. The amount of effort that somebody went through to make this. Amazing. To spec it and to build it. He even has a little golden microphone. It's ridiculous, you guys. And I showed my kids this and they freaked out. They totally freaked out. Like, Dad, why would anybody do that for you? And it's son, unlike most of you, <laughs> they actually appreciate me. People actually appreciate your father. <laughs> Chris, you could have given me a hundred thousand guesses of what you were about to lift up there, and I would not have guessed tiny Lego. Chris, <laughs> I love that thing. <laughs> That's mini me. Okay, let's take on another question. You did answer a question by accident, and maybe you were actually looking at the questions, but somebody had asked you, "What's the best part of building a community?" And you said, "This is what you do it for." Right. All right. So this, I, I know you agree with this. This is where I get confused because it's like, you look at how 99.9% .9 of people are operating where they're ignoring messages and being pretty sleazy and pushy and salesy and stuff. And for me, that's inconceivable. So it's not a question of like, why would you build community? It's like, why wouldn't you? So it's like, you're, you're making friends at scale. You're chatting passionately with amazing like-minded individuals. And then if you do a good job, they rally around you and cheer you on and support you. And that feels amazing. And then you have this whole giant impact together. Like, why wouldn't you do it? The only thing is, you know, not to is, is a lot of work. But guess what? It doesn't really feel like work that much if you're just having fun and connecting with people. So I find it very surprising that more people don't act in this way, but more power yeah. for you and I and everyone in the chat who does act this way, because I believe we're going to win in the long term. Yes. You look at this. Somebody has followed us from Clubhouse to say, and he knows exactly who I'm talking about. Cody G. Gerald, I see you. And I want to read this comment and we're getting a little bit long here. So we're probably gonna have to wrap up pretty soon that mm -hmm. you, I think you've inspired some people here today, Tom, because I think people are like community, community. Yeah, we get it. Yeah. You guys are into community building. So self-serving, right? But I think it's Johannes Bellock saying you have no high, high freaking, I can't even read this. I'm sorry. Let me scratch that. It's actually from Joy. I was reading the wrong comment. Joy said, this is awesome. I feel motivated to value my community. Yeah. And here's what Yo Good. Johannes said. You have no idea how much it means to me that you have my painting there with you. And it's so appreciated by you. Thank you so much, Tom. That's from Johannes. There you go. Thank you, mate. Appreciate you. I just yeah, realized I love something. That. My mm -hmm. powers of observation are on point today. I realized that when I speak, there's a blue banner behind me. And when our guest speaks, there's a burgundy banner behind them. Well done. Well done, Jonah. Just to <laughs> make sure that we know who is in the blue corner and the red corner, so to speak. Um, any Can we final swap? Thought? Please, my favorite color. <laughs> Get in line. Okay. Tom, <laughs> any final thoughts for you or from you from uh, in terms of like building community and what it means to you and how people can get started? <sighs> I, hopefully this session, I would say go back and rewatch it and just get started because there's so much in here. You know, I wanted to make it very actionable, but I've kept saying during this live, I really think community is the future. Like it is exploding. And this is not just me surmising this. There is data. There is an explosion in community re related jobs and roles. Like I talked about community led businesses are getting crazy VC backing, whereas they wouldn't have before. I feel like the world is starting to wake up to the power of community. And many of the examples I cited earlier, including Chris's community, only really launched in the last year. And so I would say not only should you build community and it's amazing, but you don't want to be left behind. You don't want to be the person in six years time where everyone else has a community and has six years 
years worth of community equity built in and you're just waking up to it. So I want this session to be your prompt, your call to action to light a fire under you and go build that community today and get a head start on the masses. I'm going to read this one final comment. Thank you very much, Tom. This is from Sono. Sono. It's she saying, I'm in the purple corner with both communities, not blue, not red. She's in the purple corner to support both of us. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm going kind. to, yes, it is. So before we get out of here, I want to just say thank you very much to Tom Ross. Let's go full screen on that. Tom Ross, thank you very much for being a part of this community, having your conversation, sharing the tips on how you build community. It got super, super meta here. So he is Tom Ross. <laughs> He's the CEO of designcuts.com.com, right? designcuts.com yes. mm -hmm. and he is at Indeed. Tom Ross Media on, on most social media so you can follow him there and, and you can bet if you send him a message he'll probably send you a lovely video greeting or he'll probably send you a sandwich or a cake or something that's the <laughs> other thing about you Tom that's the other thing I forgot to mention that whenever we do something together there's always a nice little box from you that arrives at my place and I'm like god that guy that Brit he's got good manners his mama <laughs> raised me up I, I need to up my game I need to make Lego Chris next time <laughs> Or maybe something more original. <laughs> right, Jonah? People got to level up the gift giving here. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> okay, that's it for us. Um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jonah. There's a graphic here. It says, thank you. Thank you, Donuts Futurist. <laughs> Step into the dojo. Have your daily dose. You know you know what you're talking about. You're part of that one billion, one billion person mission. And don't forget to... I'm going to play some music here. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit that bell for notifications. That's it for us. I'm hoping that you have an amazing rest of your day. Tom, thank you very much. Jonah, thanks for doing this. Thank Everybody, you. Peace out. Bye, everyone.